Hey, before I kick off the podcast, I just want to shout out Nextdoor Clothing. Nextdoor, uh, a clothing brand based out of Bondi in Sydney. They're making really nice jeans and shirts and hats. So go and check out their full range at nextdoorsydney.com. They're also artists, so you can go and check out a range of art. They put on rad parties, and I love what they're doing. So nextdoorsydney.com for the full range. I'm having a good time. You are? Yeah. I can tell. And we are all in Terrible happy talks. Terrible happy talks. Terrible happy talks. Terrible happy talks. Today's guest is Lance Billingsley. Lance is a surfer and teacher. He's deeply connected to the ocean, helping others, spending time with his girlfriend Jess and their dog Taco. Lance grew up in the Californian beach town of Ventura. He studied at the University of California, San Diego, in which he obtained a bachelor degree in urban studies and planning. Lance lives in Bali, teaches primary school students at an international school and initiates ocean conservation programs through his involvement in the Surf Ocean Ambassador Program, or SOAP for short. Lance loves teaching young people how to surf, surf etiquette and respect for the ocean. He has a special interest in developing young competitive surfers and supporting local surf competitions. I love Lance's approachable and calm demeanour, personal characteristics that make him an innately quality teacher, friend and all round awesome human. Lance Billingsley, welcome. Awesome. Thanks, buddy. Thanks for having me. How cool is that? Is that a high I'm all five? pumped up right now, yeah. How was your morning, brother? Good, buddy. Good. We kicked it off right. A little surf. Yeah. Got pummeled on a few. Where'd you surf at? Got tubed almost. Almost. God, that one was sick. I had oh, one I sick seen one. You. I seen you in that one, and as your girlfriend calls it, piggy dogging. Yeah, piggy dog. <laughs> <laughs> You were piggy dogging the hell out of that I thing. I tried to piggy dog that thing. Yeah, it had a little chip shot behind it, like hop, 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 Dude. pull up under it, and then it opened up wide. I'm like, oh, and then standard move. I like didn't think I was going to make it, so I kind of launched myself at the end, but the truth is I probably should have just hung on, and I didn't. <laughs> like, all I have is regret from that entire surf. <laughs> from where I was standing, you were like right in there, oh. and I was like, he's coming out, he's coming out, he's coming out. And I thought you were going to sort of doggy door it at the end, but um, it, oh. just, it just looked like it pinched you. It felt perfect. It was like a little glass bubble, dude. It was sick. Yeah. It was unexpected um, conditions this morning because there's a massive swell on the way. It's going to be giant nonstop, dude. we got to get yeah. as much of it as we can, right? It's like 20 second period. What happened to you out there, dude? Where'd you sneak off to? Dude, I was scared of those wedges. <laughs> <laughs> I, I caught two like little ones yeah, and they were like pretty steep and like there was no barrels. I got a couple of turns and then I was like, I'm scared out here. I'm going to paddle over to the river mouth where it's a bit of a fatter take. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you've got to chip. You got to take that little side wedge and like back door that peak. Otherwise, if you take off on the peak, I feel like, which is all I've ever done for the last two years here, you just get launched. Is that is that something you've really wanted to work on is your pig dogging, like your backhand tube riding? The piggy dog for sure. Actually, you know what? Or just like relaxing more on the forehand. I always feel like... I don't look that relaxed when on my forehand. Like yeah. I kind of like I've got this hunched over stance or something kind of weird. Mm. You see these guys that like drop their shoulders and they're so calm. Mm. I don't know. Maybe it's the height. I'm kind of like tall. I don't really fit into small tubes and big waves kind of scare me. So maybe it has something to do with this. Well, so you you don't feel comfortable in that position, like with you know grabbing the rail, dropping your knee, twisting your body. Like you don't feel yeah. you don't feel good. No, I think it feels good, but it always is like an adjustment. It's like it's almost there's not enough frequent time in the tube and then you go on these trips and the waves are perfect and you're like oh here it is again yeah and it takes some time right so i feel like i've never really like mastered where i want to get to at that point it's always like a, a regression and then get back to where you were and then yeah on these trips stuff like that it, it, it kills me because like i watch people like john john florence and um jamie o'brien who just look so comfortable on their backhand in a tube like you know they've got that that back leg just fully dropped and they mm. just look so comfortable and i've also got a mate of mine back in australia nathan and he's over six foot tall but he just contorts himself into this pig dog position takes off under the lip on anything yeah and just gets so battled but like i've had to work so hard at it and i still can't work it out like i get i often get lipped in the back of the head yeah or I am either too far up the face and I get sucked over, or I'm too mm -hmm. far down the face and I get cop the lip on the head. And <laughs> there was one time when I was like pig dogging, yeah, or, or probably just poo dancing, but I felt like I was pig dogging, and the lip got me in the back of the head, and it it just like pushed my neck and my chin down to my chest, and I was like, and mm. it really scared me. Like, oh shit, I could have really broken my neck then. And 
ever since then I've just had the fear in me. Do you have that fear in you? When you can imagine guys that surf like chopes and stuff too, when you take a lip to the back of the head there, <laughs> right? <laughs> well, those barrels are too big. To, like the the whole the, the whole. The, the I think whole you just adjust your mindset though. I think you get into that and you you take a big lip to the head and you get absolutely slammed. And you realize, oh, I'm actually okay. Yeah. Whereas you could just e- as easily break your neck surfing at Echo, right? I think it's probably dangerous on a, a somewhat similar level and to some extent too. It's like that sand is like concrete, dude. Yeah, especially the river mouth where it's like semi-covered reef, sand-covered reef, and like fuck yeah. And then there'll be times when you're like, you'll you'll hit the bottom on one, and then you hit this big chunk of reef when you thought it was going to be sand, and it's mm. like, oh my god, what's going on here? Totally. <laughs> so like, what are some moments in the surf when you've actually like been really scared? Pasquales, Mexico. Pasquales. Yeah, surfing. You've been down there before, yeah. I didn't surf Pasquales, um, but I mean, I've seen footage of it. That place just looks like a big epic beach break kind of like puerto really similar feel to it sometimes a bit heavier i think even than puerto and a bit more makeable but just like uh like really really deep scary deep water to extremely shallow black sand beach like mm-hmm. scald your feet hot while you're running across okay. then you get out there and you're you're shitting your pants while you're running across this hot sand so can you maybe talk us through the the lineup like did you feel like because it's a beach break that you were potentially dodging big rogue peaks yeah because you know? that's what it looks like to me when i see it in footage yeah you find the rip and you pat on the rip. The first time I was there, I was 16. And I remember I went with this guy, Craig Satcher. He was like this big, tough, muscly uh, foreman construction worker guy. And he brought me down. And he would be in his like 30s, 40s. And I remember him just yelling at me, what are you doing sitting on the beach? Get out there now. Like, follow me. You're coming with me. And I was like almost in tears on the beach. <laughs> right? But I had no choice. I was 16. I was like, I was working at a surf shop. I could never go back home to the shop. And they find out I like didn't go, right? That'd be so, cool, uh, how big was that for that <laughs> first time out there? How, what did we what are we talking? I six, mean, it felt like foot? thirty foot, but yeah, it was probably like solid six to eight foot. Mm-hmm. And I remember it was like we actually flew in that day and it was raining, and the wave isn't too far from the airport. And we landed and was like, "Fuck!" You could see that it was like offshore, and the guys were frothing. They're like, "We're straight there," and I was like, "Oh, okay, cool." Like psyched, like no friends my age, just these older two chargers that have been going there for years that brought the grom right, and they're like, "Get in the back, load our boards, tie the boards down," like you know, just why why they why they take you down? I think like kind of a, a little rite of passage. Like I'm, I imagine someone probably did that for them and it's something they'd want to do for somebody else. Kind of like you or I would do with our students too, right? A little bit. Although I feel like... Do you think like they, they seen some potential in you and they thought this is someone we want to invest some time in? Maybe. Yeah, yeah, it could be too. Yeah, kind of a lot of these guys are pretty quiet chargers that are around this surf shop. It's like a pretty core little mom and pop surf shop back home. What's it called? Uh, Revolution. In Ventura? In Ventura, yeah. And that's where you're from? That's where I'm from, yeah. So you were born and raised. Born and raised, yeah. Yeah, so like, um, is it really common for a lot of California surfers to do their first sort of big, I mean, foreign surf trip to Mexico? Is that is that the big rite of passage for California surfers to get down there? Yeah, maybe so. Huh? I think a big one in the beginning at least is like, uh, we call it Baja Malibu. It's just south of Tijuana. Mm-hmm. And it's a really heavy beach break as well, but it's like from San Diego, a 45-minute drive. Okay. So you can go down there and surf and then be back in the afternoon for a barbecue, right? So oh, we just no. jam down there on a strike. But it's significantly more heavy than any of the waves we have around San Diego, I think. Down the Pacific Coast Highway? Yeah, exactly. And then you cross the border? Cross the border, yeah. 45 minutes, you're on the beach sipping a coffee and um, looking at some bombing beach break. How do you feel when you cross that border into Mexico? Because it's such a contrast. Do you, Does it st- still have a bit of, like, do you get a bit of anxiety? Because I know I did when I crossed the border there. A bit. It wears off. I think you go enough times and it kind of, it subsides a little bit, but for sure, yeah, it's kind of that like sketch factor of the border town, right? You're crossing into like the zone, all of a sudden your safety net's kind of removed. But at the same time, I don't know, it's so close to home and um, I, know, I have so many friends in Mexico too. It's, it feels yeah. like a second home, I think now. Initially, it always feels that way and I think it feels that way, especially for people that are not from San Diego that do that crossing often. I feel like a lot of people from the States see it as like this you know, war zone, you're crossing into totally insecure or, you know, this unsafe place. And it's not necessarily the case. So, yeah, yeah I guess yeah. if you're smart about it as well, like you're not, yeah, you're not like doing silly stuff down there. You're just going for a surf. Yeah. It's pretty obvious. Totally. I think people who go down there and party are the ones that seem to get into the most trouble. A hundred percent. Yeah. You go looking for these, for all these things, right. And you get yourself into trouble down there for sure. Mm. So, um, you grew up in Ventura, okay, and then you went to school there as well. Mm-hmm. Like, what were your school days like? What were you, 
were you, did you go through all of school, like elementary school, primary school, middle school, high school? What was what was school like for you? Yeah, it's different. So I grew up kind of in a suburb called Camarillo before my parents split up. That was when I was about 13 years old. Mm-hmm. My mom moved to Ventura and my dad stayed in Camarillo at the house we grew up in. So I'd spend time between the two places and I ended up going to school in the middle at first at this place called Rio Mesa. Mm. It's in Oxnard, um, kind of like in the heart of a bunch of um, agriculture and fields and gang territory as well. But a really good school. But also you had this contrast of like big time gang scene, too. So it was uh, literally like kids getting courted to get jumped into gangs. And some kid was stabbed on campus the first year I went to school there. And like very different and very like removed from what I had hoped for. You know, I wanted to be like on a surf team or do these things that I've always heard about people doing. And um it's a very different scene there. It's like either you get into academics or you get into party and drugs or you get into g- the gang scene. Right. And there's not much outside of that, too. So um, there's a f- just a handful of surfers at that school. And I tried to make some friends with them. But it was a pretty I had a pretty tough go in the beginning of high school for sure. Like, why was it tough? Because you, you couldn't find your your place in the school. Yeah, I think you're kind of figuring out who you are, too, at that time, like jumping into high school. A lot of your friends go off to different schools and my parents had just split, too. Mm. So it was kind of like a, a cacophony of all these different things happening at once. What age was that? Uh, 14. 14. Yeah, 14. Okay. And you were just starting high school. Just starting high school. Yeah, yeah. Kind of like new social scene, getting in there, you're kind of like... You know, you don't really know yourself at all either. Um, you don't have a safety net, kind of a, a crowd to go to because your friends are all going to different schools. And then your friends that were your friends before kind of start doing their own thing or different things to you. So I remember it was kind of a... Things that you're not necessarily into or you don't identify with. True. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, like, so how did you cope then? How, like, did it just slowly get easier and you found your place or, you know, or did you just just hide from the world, like, you know? What was your mechanism? For I ditched coping? school. Yeah, I almost failed out of high school. You actually. Yeah, I ditched all the time. So that's how you coped. Yeah, I made friends that were older, way older than me. I had one good friend, Tommy, um, who would take me <laughs> surfing all the time. He'd pick me up after school, and eventually got to the point where I just didn't want to go to school anymore. Yeah. My parents were too busy, like doing their own stuff, going through divorce and all these things. And they weren't really paying attention. Yeah. So it was super easy for me to get away with like smoking weed, ditching, surfing, all this stuff. And so I was like pretty like on my own program with friends that were older than me. And before long, I had a fake ID and I was going out partying and. LA and I wasn't going to school and I was failing all my classes and um, so I think the coping mechanism I remember at one point I was actually I had a friend a really good buddy that was older than me and he would pick me up he would follow my mom's car to school she would drop me off and say bye and then I would wait two minutes and I would hop into his car and we'd drive off I would never even walk in the school gates (laughs) (laughs) it's just I'm laughing because now that I know you I don't see you as that kind of guy I I see I see you as a pretty down the line (laughs) straight edge sort of guy like but uh, you know you shouldn't judge a book by its cover should you um well i mean did you still do okay academically no absolutely no? not no yeah i think i, I failed I, I probably averaged like a 2.0 maybe a 2.5 for the majority of high school yeah i, I don't y- understand that it's uh, coming so from australia yeah like. in the grade system i think a b is worth a, th- a 3.0 if you have a flat b average if you have uh a uh, C average is a 2.0, so I was averaging like a C. Okay. Yeah, so oh. a mixture of like Ds, Fs, and maybe Bs or something like this. Like okay. All right. So uh, what was great? Ma- making up classes at the end just to graduate, and I kind of just walked out with like such such a low GPA that I wouldn't have been able to go straight to a college by any chance. Okay. So you, how did you go to college? Like, did you go to university straight from high school or... What was that transition like? What'd you do? Yeah, so I finished school and then I remember telling my dad, I was like, yeah, I want to take a year off and just like surf and did it. And he's like, sweet, no worries. You have to start paying rent next week then. <laughs> and, <laughs> uh, and so I started working two jobs at the surf shop and then at a grocery store as well, Trader Joe's. Yep. And uh, I remember I was working both jobs, like 60 hours a week or something between the two places. And after like a couple months, I was exhausted and so over it. And he's like, sweet, if you want to go to school, go to community college, I'll pay for it. And you don't have to pay rent anymore. Okay. So I was like, fuck, okay, let's do this thing. <laughs> <laughs> so it was like the lesser of two evils. Like, you're like, oh, I might as well study. And only later did I find out the same thing happened with my dad, too. He had actually bombed out of high school and then later decided mm-hmm. under that same kind of pressure, too, that he should go to school. And his parents gave him a break and they lent him money and all this. Oh, okay. So he kind of mimicked that in a way. And then my dad and I got really close. So that was like the byproduct of that as I became really close. As my mom moved further away, my dad and I got close. I went to school. Tried all these different classes, and then pretty straight away, I was like 4.0 student, like all A's. 
I think I was taking a big like class load to like 16 units or something and just like it was too easy. Um, so you were predominantly raised by your dad, would you say? No, it was definitely both parents up until the point of the divorce. And then it was my dad, for sure. My mom kind of, she's a bit of a free spirit, moved away, did her own thing. Yeah. And I respect that too. Um, and then the natural part of that was my dad stuck around and homebody kind of hung and then we just got close. Okay. I, um, I really, I was just like listening to that and I was, I was exactly the same, dude. Like, really? I mean, high school for me was like one of the best social times of my life. Like those senior years, you know, um, had like awesome little girlfriend, awesome crew of friends. And we were just like fanatical about skateboarding, you know, like, oh. I mean, where I grew up, like there's a lot of people who surfed as well. Cause we weren't far, far from the ocean, but sure. I just loved skateboarding as I was younger. Like I just identified with the culture more. We had a really solid crew and a lot of it was like hanging out, skateboarding, smoking weed. Yeah, of course. Which was just not conducive to academics, you know. <laughs> But I loved going to going to school because I had really good friends there, and but um yeah terrible grades and it was it took me a few years thereafter before mm. I went yeah I I'd like to I'd like to study you know so I didn't even go to university till I was like twenty four, but I don't I don't regret those years in between. Cause I had no yeah. idea about that with you too, buddy. Yeah. yeah. So I was like, um, the next question I got for you is going back to the whole surf thing. Do you feel like because you were into surfing through those formative years, it actually in some ways kept you out of trouble. Dude, I think it saved me from like a pretty deep depression when my parents split, to be honest. Why? Uh, because it was a place to get a reprieve from like pretty like, I remember being physically depressed, like being achy body and like really shitty in high school. Mm. And my parents are pretty clueless. Um, they knew something was up with me, but there was never like counseling or things like this. That was just kind of like, it was one of those, you know, they grew up in families where it wasn't talked about. And even though they're more progressive, they still aren't at that point where it's like, like you know, mental well-being and that kind of thing is like uh, talked about as much. Yep. So I think I, I lucked into that. I was luckily around that surf culture and, you know, a good friend's older brother threw us surfboards and dragged us to the beach. And um, I think that's what I initi- or what I later found to be the thing that would, like, save me, you know. You go get a break from all that. Thrown into cold water, shock your system. It's fucking cold in winter, right? Yeah. So it's, I think physically that's an important thing, too, all the aspects of that. Things I didn't realize then that I could just feel like the, um, how do you say, like, afterwards you feel just kind of like that ephemeral like you're just kind of light you're lighter after you surf in those moments yeah i I spoke to my mate back in australia about this a few years ago and i really feel like catching waves is only like one third of surfing for me um especially these days as i'm a bit older it's for me now it's like it's the process of going to the beach just looking at the ocean getting that ocean breeze looking at the sun even in the mornings hitting you then paddling out talking shit with your friends as you walk down the beach paddling out talking shit having a laugh and then catching waves you know like because i've i'm almost to the point of dragging it out as much as you can like i love like the coffee even before talking shit before then maybe having breakfast after it's like all that you know dude see i'm I'm all about the coffee after because it's like that's the little that's the little cherry on top like i'm out there going and towards the end of the session i'm like oh get to go for a coffee after this and after you know, doing some exercise and getting that nice seaweed or seawater on your body and the magnesium that's in ocean water. Like mm. I've actually researched it. There's magnesium in seawater and that is a natural muscle relaxant and then that soaks mm. into your skin through osmosis and it just makes you mellow, you know, combined with the vitamin D of the sun. Um, there is something to it, you know. I don't know the science behind it, but I know that when I get out of that water, I'm a different person. 100%, you know? yeah. But I was talking to my buddy about it, like, because I'm, especially as I'm getting older, I'm less concerned about surfing the best peak on the beach as I, as opposed to just being in the water and True. maybe surfing a peak that's not as good, but with less people on it, you know, that's becoming more important to me, you know? Um, it's, yeah, I think it's you a really beautiful s- way to live. You really see that here in Indo too, where the waves are so perfect all the time. You kind of realize, wow, it's not about just scoring the best wave, you know, to yourself. It's more like, wow, okay, my mates are all here. We're having a good time. We're talking shit, getting some waves, yeah, cheering each other on, that kind of thing, right? How, how are you enjoying the sheer consistency of the surf in Bali? It's insane. It's too it's much. Insane. It's insane. There's nothing like this yeah. anywhere in the world. It's no. insane. There's no flat spill. I don't think I've seen it under waist high in two years here. Yeah. Same. It's always a wave, right? It's amazing. 
Um, and it's too big. You have the opposite problem. It's just too big. Now the swell is just too big consistently, and you're like, where the fuck do we go? Yeah. Where's the, where's the protected <laughs> option? You know, like, True. I don't know what it's like in Southern California, but where I'm from on the east coast of Australia, it, you know, it can be really fickle where we get a lot of variable winds. You right. know, we get a lot of, we get a fair few south swells, but it can sometimes be two months where you just don't, you can't surf. And um, coming here, like, you can literally, if you really wanted, you could surf 360 days a year. Um, and it's it's almost, like, to the point where my whole mindset has changed now. I don't even look at forecasts. I just look at tides. Yeah. Okay, oh, low tide. All right, we're going here. Yeah. Okay. Oh, or it's too big. We're going here. Okay, it's way too big. Can't, we're not surfing. <laughs> totally. Let's just drive to the beach and look in the morning yeah. and see what's going on and then assess. Yeah. It's crazy. Our two lives are actually, they parallel each other pretty, they're pretty similar, right? Where we come from and it, that we get inconsistent surf at home and then we come here and we're almost like overwhelmed by the way it is here. Like we literally have flat spells at home where it's two months of no surf. Yeah. You take a long board because that's just like your only option, right? Mm. So your brother got you into surfing? Not my brother. My brother's like the opposite of me. So he's my half brother, but I grew up with him. Six years older, like into like BMX and like... Uh, rollerblading and like things like this very different right whereas like my best my, my best friend growing up he, both of his brothers surfed and they would probably make fun of my brother so luckily for me um, my brother wouldn't let me hang with him too much it wasn't cool we were too far apart in age and so I kind of like stuck with my buddy and his brothers and they were like full grom abusers take the surfboard you're not coming back and we're dropping you off we'll be back in four hours bring your your brown bag sack lunch and hang at the beach bring a sweatshirt it's gonna be fucking cold <laughs> <laughs> How do you feel about grom abuse? Yeah, we were talking about this yesterday, right? What do you think? I, I think it has a place. I don't know. What do you think? Why? Because it, you're kind of unaware. You're just so frothed out as a grom. It's like all you can think about is yourself. Your vision is so just t- your pure tunnel vision, right? Even though the, you can see value in people around you a little bit, it's all about you getting the most waves. Do people see your wave? I remember so, being so obsessed about just my own progression that it takes that kind of humbling experience of like, no, this is not all just about you. And like, there's something in there. I don't know exactly how to put that into words, but something within that, that humbling, you're not the top of the food chain kind of thing. Yeah, I think, I think hierarchies are necessary mm. sometimes in, in the surf. I, I've developed a bit of a theory that the, um, that, I mean, not a theory, but I, surfing is a really selfish endeavor, you know? Yeah. And when you're a grommy, you, you can't regulate it. Because you're frothing so much, you know. And I, I, I do understand it. Like, you need the older guys to, to show you what it's about. And that sure. you've got to earn your stripes and you've got to show respect. Um, in Australia, I mean, the stories of grom abuse can, were, were horrendous. I don't, I don't think it's like that anymore because I think people <laughs> have become so litigious. People are scared of lawsuits and stuff like that. But I still think there's a place for some gentle, tough love. Totally. You agree? Yeah. The question is, how do you do it? Because yeah. we have our students, and sometimes I feel like we're still a little too soft and gentle with them, and they can be kind of sensitive, and there's there's that boundary, obviously, where we're professionals and teachers, and we're mm-hmm. you know, they're in our care, so we're responsible that way, too, whereas there's a different dynamic if it's a younger brother or a grom around the surf shop, you know? <laughs> Did you cop much grom abuse? Oh, yeah, buddy. We talked about this, right? I think the worst I had, I was um, the surf shop I used to sweep the floors of when I was like... 13 to 15 years old they uh we would wax snowboards in the back in this back room where all the shoes and everything were as well and uh at one point i was just mouthing off to them and they picked me up arms and legs about three of them they duct taped me upside down to the uh they uh duct duct taped me upside down to uh one of the posts on the (laughs) shoe racks and they put snowboard wax up my nose (laughs) then they closed the door and turned off the lights i remember i was such a a brat too. I was like, yeah. just telling him like, fuck you guys. You guys can't bum me out. And then they locked me in there for like a good hour or two. Yeah. Um, and then luckily I had a phone in my pocket. I think I was calling the shop over and over and over to the point mm-hmm. where they couldn't stand it anymore. Cause there's customers out front. Yeah. Um, where, where were you surfing mainly as a Grommy around Ventura, like Ventura point? Really? Yeah. V- Ventura, Ventura point or County point? line. County line is like the, the South end of that. So we're kind of like in the agriculture area of Camarillo and then it's pretty much 30 minutes to either point. Or 20 minutes to either point, either Ventura Point or County Line, which is just south of Point Magoo, a pretty famous um, surf spot. But you have to have military clearance to get on there. 
That's not that place they call the ranch, is it? Not the ranch. The ranch is further north. That's past uh, Point Conception. That's Central California. So oh. we're still the we're the northern tip of Southern California. Ah, oh, okay. Yeah. So, like, would you ever go on missions up to Rincon when it was pumping? And oh, stuff fuck like yeah, that? for sure. Yeah, absolutely to Rincon. Rincon is the most consistent mm-hmm. wintertime spot when it's on. It's like, I don't mean consistent in the term of how much swell there is there, but consistently the best wave. There's a series of a couple point breaks there, so it's all like you grow up watching people you know carving down the line and style and all these things it's i didn't grow up around a huge air game and now here i am struggling to try to do my first air and i'm 30 years old i'm like trying to stick in air i'm like fuck i can't do this you're not just trying to stick air it's like you're you're trying to throw air reverses let's let's clarify sure yeah yeah i'm getting close dude i'm getting close around like dude it's it's awesome and I, i love that because you just said um 30 years old like that's that's young in my opinion and i think progression should never stop you know um it's yeah, great. let's keep pushing like, it, dude. What a great goal to set, like, yeah. But I have seen you do other straight airs. Have I? Yeah, I've seen you do a few. Really? Little ones. Yeah, some little ones. Like you'll you'll hit the you'll hit the end section and you know land in the flats and stuff. A little like ollie that. out into the flats or yeah. something. Yeah, that's about all I got, dude. I'm getting close though. I'm gonna stick one eventually. I just gotta figure out what the. Uh, someone told me in the water the other day. This guy, he's on the QS. He's like, man, it's all about just like about relaxing. He's like, it's the people that survive in car accidents, the ones with the most relaxed. He's like, it's the <laughs> same principle with landing air. He's like, just fucking relax. I'm like, all right. Mm, yeah. So I'm trying that. Yeah, cool. That's oh, good. Give you, some, give you some motivation when you're out there. When you were surfing um, Rincon, right, would you see Bobby Martinez and those guys out there? Yeah, one of the guy I told you about, Tommy, that used to take me to the beach when I was a, a grom. Mm. Same guy that would leave like voicemails on my home phone. I'd run home and he'd be like, yeah, I'm going to come pick you up. This is before cell phones, right? So I'd be on the answering machine, you'd play it. And he's like, dude, are you ready in 20 minutes? We're going to come pick you up. And we'd go to the base on Point Magoo because our buddy had military clearance. And it's this really epic, just big peak. Um heavy just getting throttled when i was a grom absolutely smashed so uh, that's a pretty fond memory but um yeah you said bobby martinez tommy used to surf against him he's a really good surfer he's a firefighter at home now mm-hmm. but uh he used to be a competitive surfer and definitely would be in contention for a qsct kind of guy but super humble and he just decided at one point he wasn't he was always sponsored too um he just decided at one point that he wasn't going to pursue it because he didn't like the idea i think of um I don't know what maybe what would happen if it didn't work out or you know what if it wasn't all it, it worked up to be and he was huge on service and kind of like giving back to so he went the firefighter route but I remember he used to go to he'd have competitions these NSSA comps and I'd go with him and Bobby Martinez and Dane and all these guys would be there and I'd be hanging out eating gummy bears in the back just like frothing right I remember sitting next to Dane like we had binoculars and we were at Huntington watching the comp and I think Tommy was surfing and I was sitting with Dane like trading binoculars with him checking out chicks on the beach Pretty cool. And just like full frothing grom, right? Wow, man. Yeah, I, I, I think I'd froth on Dane still. It, like, I'd fan out on Dane even now. Totally. Yeah. There's only a few people I think I'd really fan out on, like him, Slater, Shane Dorian. Yeah. Shane Dorian, I, Actually, yeah. I fanned out on... on Healy, Greg. maybe. Healy's a waterman, too. Yeah. yeah. No, you don't yeah, feel no, it. Yeah, yeah, but... <laughs> I love, oh, man, I love... How can you not love that guy? But um, I fanned out on Greg Long. The other night, you did remember when we met when we met him at that. Oh yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, like yeah, he's gonna be on the podcast at some point. Right? <laughs> <laughs> we'll we'll get him on here. Mm. So, like, what was your first ever surfboard? First ever surfboard, yeah. a Matt Moore. It was a hand me down from one of my buddy Blake's brothers. The yellowest, grossest thing you've ever seen. So it was a hand me down. How like Just what full was, was it? A, was it, it like a swallowtail? It was like a swallowtail five thruster? five eight thruster, and I like didn't even know okay. how to stand up yet. I was okay. just getting whomped at like this beach break for I think probably six months, just getting throttled. Mm. But me and my buddy both right, and eventually it was like we progressed from standing up on our boogie boards to standing up on these surfboards to just being full on like frothers. How old were you? Uh, thirteen. Thirteen. Yeah. Okay, it's a good age that's when it seems like a lot of people start yeah but not now dude people start so young right like you got you were just talking about shane dorian his kid is absolutely killing the game and he's like Mm. what nine or something is that jackson dorian sounds right i don't know he's at the wave pool like doing stuff that made me sad (laughs) (laughs) i get sad watching grommy surf all the time like they're not only are they okay they throw airs around and i can sometimes go oh well they're just throwing airs around they can't turn and then you see him do something like lay back Carb, mm. drop wallet, th- you know, tail slide, just straight out of the the textbook. I'm just like, oh god damn it! But anyway, it's um, true. It's such a it's such a beautiful sport. Like, but that. it's it's cool too, right? Like in some sense, you see that and you're like, wow, the level of 
the progression is going to be crazy. Well, you'd be crazy to you'd be crazy to think that progress wasn't going to happen. I mean, that's what you want to see, like, yeah, because otherwise, all the work of the the our I guess our forefathers of surfing would go to waste because they they're the ones that paved the way for what's possible. And if if Grommies aren't taking it to the next level, well, it's all it's all wasted, isn't True. it? You know, yeah. I see it in skateboarding all the time, like. Some of the up and coming skate kids are doing things after two years of skateboarding that took some other skaters a lifetime to learn and it's because they actually seen someone else do it and then that seed was planted. Yeah. And made it you know, made made it in their mind possible, you know. Whereas back in the day, no one knew what was possible. It was like Right. And they're the people that break down the barriers. They break down the, the, the walls of of what's what's actual possible in progression double-edged sword though i think it's beautiful but it's also kind of it's different now too because you have these kids that are training and in gyms and they have coaches like mm. what 13 year old kid that wants to be a pro surfer doesn't have a coach right now so yeah. the, the grom abuse is out the this kind of stuff is out and what's in is like you know dad recording on camera and critiquing the sun and mm. whistling to him in the water and coach in the meantime training him to get fit and all this mm. stuff it's kind of like it, it takes, a little, the, takes a little bit of the takes a little bit of the I don't know, the love out of it, no? It takes like a little bit the of magic? like the, the magic out of it. That's a better way of putting it. Yeah, it's just kind of like the the pure stoke. Instead, it's like expectations through the roof. Like, where's the progression? It looks the progression rather than the froth. Yeah. I was talking to Nev Hyman about this, and he was like, you know, it's actually, when you think about it, surfers are really promoting healthy lifestyles these days compared to what they were doing in the 80s and 90s. Like, yes. when the World Tour was still a party, you know, and it was kind of like... The best surfers were just the ones that could party the hardest and then still whip the next day. Yeah, true. Yeah, I remember hearing stories of these guys yeah. showing up totally lit yeah. to comps, right? Yeah. And still just tearing the bag. But the 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 life expectancy of a pro surfer back then was was short, but you know but it's changed. It's it's changing. So he said in that respect it's it's a really good thing, you know. So but how how do you feel in general about the state of surf culture these days? In what sense? In terms of the image in terms of how people are conducting themselves in the surf, how crowded it's getting, how mainstream it is, like especially yeah. living in Bali, like you it's see the full spectrum, now. but how do you feel yeah. about it? Cause I mean, I go through periods of negativity. Totally. And I think here it's like, a, it's, we're almost our own microclimate here in Bali as well. And it's really easy to get jaded here because you have these guys that are, you have like your your QS level rippers around. It's really cool that push the limits. And then you have these guys that are kind of like, I don't know how to say it. There's just so many different crews, I guess, is what I'm trying to get at. Yeah. That it's it's almost overwhelming. You have all these these foreign groups and these guys that are shredding and then complete kooks and we're all mixing the lineup and everyone's trying to get a piece of a wave. And, then and the it's, local crew. And then the local crew, which deserve respect too. But um, yeah, I think sometimes it's just kind of, it's like overwhelming, right? Everyone's, like you said earlier, it's a selfish endeavor and everyone's kind of trying to get their own peace. So here it's kind of like insane. Well, how do you negotiate that in the in a, in a busy well, lineup? I'm a full-on dog, dude. I know exactly where to sit at the river mouth. I have like my own little spot. And then people are sort of sheep. Like they do this thing where you can push them deeper and deeper and deeper and you flip and paddle back the other way and then they're too deep and you go. Okay. So it's just kind of a doggy move though. It's not like, I think I've just grown accustomed to, sh to turning it off. Because yeah. you have a bit of like, a, how do you say, like a anonymity here? Mm -hmm. Like you're not yeah, really you known. Yeah. So it's like you can kind of be a, a, an asshole in the water. Not that I am, but that you're not. You, to an extent, I kind of, I'm aggressive. You have to be, otherwise you're not getting waves. Passive around aggressive. <laughs> around people that you're probably never going to see again anyway. So it's yeah. a little bit like, it's something it, it took me a little while to get used to here. I don't like it. At home, I would never do that. Mm. That's something I don't want to take back home with me for sure. Because it's not, I'm not proud of that. But yeah. So you're saying there's less accountability. Oh, 100% here. There's yeah. very little. Yeah. I mean, the lineup changes. I mean, you start to get to know the people that, the, well, the expats that live here, um, but they're still not locals, really. True. And then you've got your local locals, and it's very obvious who the locals are. Yeah. So I actually like how black and white it is mm. in terms of, like, the hierarchy is very clear, in my opinion. Yeah, yeah, when the locals paddle out, if it's Sunday and there's eight locals in the water forget yeah. it i'll oh, sit yeah. on the beach and watch and they shred it's a it's a pleasure sometimes too yeah. right yeah but you're never gonna you're never gonna be the the one in priority sitting out the back getting called into waves yeah it is but another thing i'm, I'm starting to learn about bali is like there's just okay yeah it's busy but the surf's so consistent and mm. it's there's just plenty of waves to go around like i get more waves here than i ever do at home True. and so like many you, options here too, like yeah. Like you said, you get people who are here for a week and they haven't figured the lineup out yet and they could be a good surfer, but they're getting a bit lost in 
in where to sit and, and you can sort of take advantage of that. <laughs> true, yeah. yeah. That's totally true. And you can't forget about just how diverse Indonesia is too with all the waves that are here and all the little novelty spots that are everywhere too with all this well there's always something someone's always got a secret to spill yeah. you know and then a secret to keep and there's all these little spots you're always hearing about and i think that's super enticing because for us at home there's only so many whereas we're this nation of islands right so there's so many setups here it's ins- it'll drive you insane i feel like it's being here is one thing that keeps like the froth alive huge because i'm just like trying to look around the next corner like what's this going to do when taking notes but it's so massive right yeah yeah do you feel do you feel like you're more of a surfer here than you were back home? Yeah, totally. Dude, yeah. when I pack my bags to come here, I brought mainly like twin fins and for the first six months I was here, I think I only rode my twenty at Old Man's. Right. I didn't even surf Echo. Why? At all. It was too it was too frothy, too serious, and I was over shortboards completely. Because at home for us, mm-hmm. like I don't know, I think maybe I just grew accustomed to these point breaks and these waves and you can always surf kind of shittier waves yourself and that necessitates a twin fin or something like this too. And so I just got to love my 20 and that was just kind of my new mindset. Yeah. But then you come here and after a while you realize you're sort of letting go an opportunity of like really epic waves like Padang and all these setups. And you're like, okay, wait, yeah. shift the mindset again, get on some high performance shortboards, get after it. Do you find if you ride 20s too much and then you transition to a thruster, traditional shortboard thruster, yeah. do you find that it, it sort of ruins your surfing a little bit? No. No. Uh-uh. I think it keeps you dynamic. I think it's important. I think what fucks your surfing up is... Uh, uh, riding these things like the the dumpster diver or like the the short the pod the pod the short wide model and then transitioning back and forth between that and a short board because it gives you a false sense of like absolute shredding and control but then once the waves get even slightly substantial you're a complete you can't use that board mm-hmm. and you try to ride a short board and it feels like this big awkward you know plank under your feet yeah all rockered out and weird. So I, th- I think that's what messes your surfing up. Whereas a twin fin is just, t- it's so different that you don't ever lean into a 20 like you do with a shortboard. At least I don't have any that I do. It's You just approach the wave differently. It's like a different dance entirely, I think. Yeah. Like over the course of your surfing, and I know we're talking a lot about surfing, which is great because I could talk about it all day. And totally. I'm so glad to be talking to <laughs> a surfer. Um, like what boards of like, what what have been some standout boards for you in your life? Like boards that you've just gone, that was the sickest board. Dude, it's that. funny you're asking. I, you know, I just started taking pictures of boards and favoriting the picture so that I have evidence of it. Because I always forget. I'm like, what size is this board? What's da, 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 How many liters? I think the liters are huge, right? But uh, you mean short boards or just like anything? Any board. Dude, dead kooks, that Eden Sol shape, the, the 20 is What's, insane. Well, okay. What's, was it a okay, 20... A dead kooks super twi- wide lots of volume forget the name of that pulled model. in tail yeah super pulled in uh swallow tail it almost looks like a pin but it's got a, a really like cute little swallow at the end of it okay so and it's it not just a deep cu- swallow it absolutely just it, like goes to town on small gutless waves and so fun and like it's you know the way just running down the beach people are like psyched on it too it looks cool it's not okay. like shortboarding you know no one's ever complimenting your shortboard <laughs> Whereas like alternative craft there's always your like crowd of people who are like oh sick look he's getting after this weird shape and it's it's kind of fun, right? Yeah, okay. The smile factor is high with those kind of boards. Okay, so that was one. What's another one? Mm, rocket wide. I can't get off of it, and it's destroying my surfing. Well, the uh, the Almeric rocket wide. Yeah, yeah. You is gotta, that what you're riding at the moment? You got to have it. Yeah. That seems like the 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 full on popular board right now. Like I mean, everyone's. It's got the only one. reason I didn't make that yeah. barrel this morning. A hundred percent. I was on a short board, but it absolutely, made it. it's too short. It wasn't doesn't carry enough. speed. As soon as you hit a foam ball or like a, a bump. Yeah. It's like See, it doesn't adjust in any any real wave of consequence. It's not intended for. Here's another way to think about it. Maybe yeah. the pace of it is what got you so deep in the first place. Do you know ah, what I mean? Fair like enough. If you were if you were on a shortboard, yeah, you, maybe you would have outrun that barrel. But you should be in control. You should be able to sit then too, right? Hmm, that's interesting. Because I'm I, I'm starting. But I'm with you. I'm with you. Yeah, like a pace of a board. Because I mean, you see it in Bali so much. Like people, myself included, um, just outrunning barrels. You know? Yeah. Oh, and it's painful. When, when they really could have been so it's deep. Painful. Yeah. But, and I, I've, I, I remember I did have a pod, for a while, and I felt that the pace of it was getting me in barrels more. Like, um, and I wasn't probably not coming out as m- of many as I could have, but it was actually getting me where I wanted to be a lot easier. That flat outline. Sometimes that can yeah. be a really nice thing for paddle ability. It's like insane, right? You can get into these Low waves. Rocker. Low rocker. Yeah, but as soon as you get into real curvature of a wave, like a barrel or something, that the, the the traction you get is way less stable. I feel like you're way more likely to slide. And mm. So growing up, were you riding a lot of Almerics? 
Yeah, totally. I remember this. Everyone does, yeah. Yeah, at the shop I worked at, we'd always get a hookup. They're like 250 bucks. And I remember at one point, just before Clark Foam went out of business, I got one shaped by, by Al. No way. I have an Al handshape at home. It's like all beat to shit. Handshaped? A handshape by Al. No yeah, way. Yeah. I mean, handshape. It was probably finished out of a CNC, but it's signed by Al. Wow, um, that's like that's a keeper. In, in so this, it's funny now. And in I, this I remember day and age I, of machined boards. Totally. I remember I didn't like what I should have done is pack it away and save it somewhere, right? But I rode the fuck out of it. And it's like yellow and beat and horrible. But you can still see his signature. It says Four Lance and it's signed by him. So it's cool. <sighs> it's a keeper. Just keep it forever, right? That's what I do now is if I have a board that I just love, I, yeah. don't, I don't offload it. So I just keep it. So I'm accumulating like a library of all my favorite boards like over the course of my life. Sure. Um, so for example, I have a... I have a, um, like I got one of those Almeric samplers and I've just kind of like, um, just uh, stuck with it because it cost me so much money and just sort of, I guess, meandered, <laughs> meandered through it. Pot committed. But I'm just like, nah, and now I've got it up for sale. Like I just want to get rid of it. But get rid of it, dude. Don't waste a moment on yeah, it. That's yeah. what I think. But it's like boards that I've just loved, like instead of like trying to get some money back on them for my next board, I'm just like, nah, I keep it. And I've actually now got about, I think about five or six that just sit there, don't get ridden. Um, yeah, dude, I'm the same way. It's funny. I'm yeah. the, at this point now where I look around and see people riding boards that are shitty. I'm like, dude, there's no life too short. Yeah. Sell it, get rid of it, leave it, but don't, yeah. don't waste time having shitty surfs on this board that you don't like. Dude. It's not worth it. Dude, I'm going to go buy a rocket wide right now. Now go. No, no so, don't do it. It'll so ruin your expensive. surfing. Dude, they're expensive. <laughs> they're so expensive. Fucking expensive. <laughs> but like you said, like life is too short, you know, and where did you develop that philosophy? When, when did that start? Cause that's, a, I've noticed that about you. You, you you seem to be living day by day and in the present and enjoying life. Trying, buddy, trying. Why? Like, why do you have that mindset? I mean, it is short now. Yeah. Got to, got to do it. Especially here, there's so many people like getting after it. It's pretty like you get inspired around here. Mm. It's a different, different mindset around here. I think back home, I'd be a little more, not tame, but I'd be a little more likely to go along with kind of the, the casual like career life at home. Actually, mm. that's what I was doing for like four years before I came here too. So yeah, you, teaching. You went to university and did urban planning. Yeah. Why? Yeah. Why urban planning? Uh, I remember I was transferring to UCSD mainly because there's a wave called Blacks just behind it. I got into a couple of colleges. One Is that for Carlsbad. No, it's, it's uh, La Jolla. Yeah, a little further south. Okay. But I remember I got into like um, Cal Poly, which is in Central California for engineering and then I got into this school which is like way more reasonable probably a really good career makes a lot of money and then I got into this school for like social sciences and I remember I, I mainly chose it because I had a friend going to school there and I knew there was an epic wave there it's like again surfing just like <laughs> dictating where I go yeah. um, but it was a, a really good thing we had a super cool mm -hmm. crew of people when I went to undergrad there we all lived on the same block had like five houses like 30 of us all friends on the surf team yeah. competing going to school and wet boardies that kind of thing yeah, it, it's definitely ruined me, like, in terms of where I live. You know, and yeah. unfortunately, to live near good surf breaks, it's always the most expensive real estate in the world. <laughs> That's true. But it's like, what a, what a way to live, you know? You get yourself a good spot back home, though, too. Yeah, for sure. I'm from I'm from a part of the world. It's the east coast of Australia, south of Sydney, a part, a part of the world called Wollongong. And um, it's, like, one of the most aesthetically beautiful places I think I've ever seen. Like, when you look at it, it's this big escarpment or mountain range like right on the water and it's just got beach break after beach break reef points like littered up and down in in like probably like a 10 kilometer radius or yeah. maybe more like i'm not very good with distances but you know you pretty much can find a wave in most wind and swell conditions down there um but yeah like like you said it's i've often thought about it i'm like oh it really dictates how i live but like is that a bad thing no, I don't think it's, it could be worse, right? We could be like chasing the next meth high or something instead. <laughs> <laughs> it yeah, could definitely be worse. Yeah, no, you're right. I love that. It's true. I, I, I definitely don't want to chase a meth high. So you went, you did um, urban planning university and then you graduated and then, then what'd you do? How'd Not, you, so you did a master's of teaching? Yeah, that came later. So I got out and there were no jobs. It was kind of like a depression in, in the in work down in San Diego. There wasn't much happening. Was that the GFC time? Global financial crisis? It would have been right around global financial crisis. Yeah, it was in the midst of that for sure. Um, slow. I couldn't even get an internship at a big company I wanted to work with down in San Diego working for like pennies just mm -hmm. to get experience. And I applied for a couple of positions, didn't get in, and um, opportunity came along to go teach English in Argentina in South America randomly I worked at this group that came to San Diego and did an exchange and they're like dude just come down hang with us we got a job for you come here 
I was like, sick. Argentina, like, packed a surfboard with me, went no, down there. Why? There's absolutely no waves. It's cold, but there's just, like, tons of beautiful women, right? Yep. And, um, well, like... I don't know. I've never been there, but... Yeah, you like... It's just big, big... Uh, good culture. Super cool culture. Super friendly. Sit around, uh, sip mate in a park, chat, Ma- have beers. Mate is that green tea type Yeah, herba mate. Yeah, you sip yeah. it out of, like, a gourd with the bombisha. It's like that Seen metal it. straw thing. It's the it's steel-looking pot. In a steel show. Exactly. It's a Brazilian. It's a Brazilian tea or drink or South American. Yeah, South American. I think you give it. There's a, there'd be used kind of throughout, but it's it's predominantly a big Argentinian thing. So is it highly caffeinated? It's not caffeinated at all, but it's a different sort of high. It's like and some people trip out. So people you get lightheaded get a, and like faint after. You get a high after, off it. You get a high off of it, and it's not caffeine. Yeah. Ah, I didn't know that. Yeah, the mate. No they, like, strong flavor too, it. dude. Yeah, they love it. Wow, man, and it's good for you. It's good for you. Like an antioxidant, maybe. Maybe. I don't know. You seem, pretty, <laughs> you seem pretty healthy. So how long were you down in Argentina? I did that for six months, and I lived in a little oil drilling town called Comodoro Rivadavia, and then I got really... I was actually only there for three months, and then I had something like a little bit crazy happen to me there. I like, started seeing this girl for a minute, and then um, like we didn't really understand each other because I spoke no Spanish, and she spoke no English. She was Brazilian, and um, this guy showed up outside my work, and like... I guess it was her ex-boyfriend. He was like a former police officer and he like pulled out a gun on me just outside the school. And he's like, you have two weeks to, to leave the entire country or I'll find you and I'll like, you know. <laughs> oh my God, dude. Everybody was shaking so bad. I was like, whoa, serious? I don't know what to do. I don't do and, I, and, I, um, and then the head of school found out and she sent me off anyway. She's like, dude, you got to get out of here. Get on a bus tonight. It's like a 24-hour bus drive. from. It's basically in Patagonia, right? So 24-hour wow. bus up to Buenos Aires to the capital where the company is that I was working for. And they sent me straight there. Like, just go. I remember still, even when I got back, I was still shaky. I was like looking over my shoulder everywhere and in the town thinking this guy was going to show up. When in reality, it was probably just a big So hang on a second. Move. So you started dating her mm-hmm. and then there was a communication breakdown. So she may have said to you in Spanish, but you didn't understand, hey, I've got a psycho ex-boyfriend. Yes. And you would have been like... Yeah. Si, si, senora. Si, senor. But you didn't know what you were actually... Yeah, exactly. He actually, um, he hacked into her, he had her password for her Facebook account. We were sending like messages back and forth or whatever. And he actually like printed off all the papers and brought them to me. I'm like, dude, who are you? Like, what's going on? I had no idea. No idea. So then he turned up to the school. He was calling me a whole bunch. He's like, come outside, come outside. I'm like, dude, who, who are you? Like, what's going on here? And he's like, yeah, come around the corner, hop in my car is what he told me originally. I was like, this what? seems weird. And I asked my buddy Mark to come with me at the time and... He was, he'd been working at that school for a while, and he came around the corner, and he's like, what's going on here? It like, seems really hostile and intense, and he started speaking Spanish and translating for us, and I remember the moment my buddy realized what was going on, he looked at me, and he's like, dude, what are you doing? And she was the, the Brazilian chick was the secretary at the school, right? And he's like, what are you doing? Like, this guy's insane. He's affiliated with the police, da 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 and then he pulled out the Glock out of his car, and he's like... He's holding it. He's holding it. He held it up. It was like broad daylight, he dude. Didn't just point it at just around the school, just around the corner from the school. Uh, I, dude, as you? soon as he pulled it out, I just turned and started walking as fast as I could, and I ducked behind a car. And he was just... Was he holding it down by his side? Yeah, and he held it up to kind of show that he had it, right? As a Glock. It was a Glock, yeah. I mean, he's a police officer. He and had this, right? So did you walk connections. away backwards slowly? Oh, uh, walk did you away just backwards turn slowly, and, run the and then fuck like out just of there. you know, super like just high, completely high. Like I had no idea, just adrenaline to the max. He walked around the corner. I remember I bought a pack of ciggies afterwards. And I started smoking <laughs> cigarettes. I don't even smoke ciggies, dude. What's going on? <laughs> oh my god, dude. Yeah. yeah so what about the, what about the girlfriend? Like. Did oh, no, dude, I was so scared. I was honest. I never, like, she would message me, like, hey, let's meet up. She left, too, so she fled after that. Or not fled. Because but of him. She left, yeah. She didn't want to be around, and she was Brazilian anyway, so I think she went back to Brazil, and she was messaging me, but I was so, um, I was so worried that this guy would get affiliated again yeah. that I, I wouldn't even, I never, ever responded to any of her messages so, ever again. I blocked her. So you so <laughs> from that moment on, the relationship was over, and you never spoke to her never again? Never saw her again, no. <laughs> dude, I ran for my life, dude. I was so scared. <laughs> Holy shit, dude. Oh, man. Wow. Let's, okay, let, let's go on to a different topic because, like, yeah. So you went from, that you was went weird. from there that was weird. and then you moved to, from Argentina, you moved to, like, you, you got the fuck out of Argentina. No, so I had a few more months, actually. I calmed down and I stayed in Buenos Aires, which is a full 25-hour yeah. drive from where the yeah. gun got pulled on okay. me. And I, and I settled down. I was, I was, yeah, I was reassured that nothing would happen. He was... A lot of the Argentinians would laugh at me. They're like, dude, he's just being a macho guy. Nothing's going to happen. So I eventually I settled down, stayed there with a really cool family for a few months in a home exchange, learned Spanish, mm-hmm. um, got a good base. And then I left. I brought my surf shit and I went north 
to where there's actually waves. That would have made sense if I did that in the first place, probably. To uh, to Peru. Peru, yeah. Yeah, big, straight. Big left handers everywhere. Yeah, straight to to Lima, and there's some really sick waves just outside of Lima. Again, yeah. guided by the surf. Right at that point, I remember writing. I was doing like a journal. And when I, when I was leaving that, I'm like, dude, don't ever take surfing for granted. And I wrote it in a journal. I still have oh it to this my. day. I'm like, don't ever take this shit for granted again. I'm like, go to the it's coast. True. Stick to what you, like, this thing you know. Instantly met some cool people up there. Scored really sick waves around Peru. Yeah. yeah. And how long did you stay there? Uh, I think we were in Peru for a month or two. And then, um, no, sorry, three months. I went up to the north of Peru. And that's when I kind of got, like... It was on is like month nine of this travel, right? And kind of realized, okay, it's time to like maybe do something with my life. And then I started studying for the GRE. So I was like surfing these waves around the north end of Peru uh, in this area called Lobitos. Okay. It's really sick left hand slabs. Yeah. Um, in the desert, in the middle of nowhere. And I was just studying for the GRE. I remember I just bootlegged, downloaded all the materials, and I would just study when it would go flat. And I would study, and then I'd surf, study, surf, and then. Um, when I was ready, a couple months later, I drove to Lima in an in a, uh, international testing center. I took the test for my grad school mm. application. And, like, what's the – like, sorry to keep going back to surfing, but, like, sure. I've heard there's a lot of nice left-hand point breaks around there. And, you know, it's cold water. What's the surf scene like, the local crew? Is it just – is it just epic? Dude, so many Brazos, it's crazy. Brazilians. So many, because so they come over for the waves, but as soon as it's on, no one goes, and it's absolutely sick, sick waves. So as soon as it gets overhead high there, it needs solid swell. What, no one surfs? Um, like the local crew don't surf. These guys, there's local crew that surf, and there's a handful of guys that'll charge, but not many of them. So when it's really on and heavy and barreling, there's, it's all the, it's like really, you're trading off these perfect, perfect tubes. I remember standing in a couple of these things. Like I, that's where I learned how to like kind of backhand tube right. Eventually, I, I realized that you have to like pivot your feet forward instead of being um, like sideways. Both are, like so, your toes are slightly pointing forward. Slightly pointing forward. Yeah, more of the the piggy dog, right? <laughs> As Jess would say. And to help you with the piggy dog stance. To help with the piggy dog. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> to center your weight over your board because I forever would have been like. Yeah regular just parallel stance on my board poo yeah. pooing over my board falling mm. over in the barrel doing that over and over and over and then yeah like in that poo stance is more because you're actually like just folding from the hips and you're not actually totally. bending the knees low enough and you squatting like you can't get low enough yeah, right yeah because when you do that like I, I, i've learned that like i've watched footage of myself i'm like oh my god dude i'm poo stancing it's terrible and i realized it's because i didn't have enough like flexibility in my hips and my knees and i wasn't squatting down i was just bending over you know and it's like and i had to do some like mobility training to to improve that flexibility you're pretty so, self-aware dude that's cool that you can identify that and then like go in and tactically just start stretching more or doing specific kind of uh, it's more because i had i had a bunch of injuries i had a really bad ankle injury that just wouldn't heal for six years and two operations later and it just put me on this path of like holy shit surfing and skateboarding could be taken away from me through injury yeah true. i don't know how i would live so i just kind of had a moment about six or seven years ago where i'm like i've got to do everything i can to be as healthy and as fit as possible because i need to keep these things in my life otherwise true. i'm gonna i don't I don't know how I'd survive without them. It's them. crazy to me that you still get after it in skating, though, dude. Skating, the, the falls are so horrendous and so more, I think you've, injuries you can sustain can just be. I'm a lot smarter about it. Like, I mean, I've, I started skateboarding when I was like 12 years old and I've, it, there was like through my teen years, it was like all I did and then started to dwindle off through my 20s, but it was always there. And it's kind of like I'm at the point now in my 40s where I'm like, I've just done it so long. Sure. Like, I just can't stop now. You know, and w my approach to it has changed because at some days it's like I don't need to be striving to be the best skater at the skate park. Some days it could just be a matter of rolling around, you know. Um, there's a pro skater called Jamie Thomas and he's the same age. And I mean, that guy is amazing. Like he's just Legend, the next right? level. Like, just the he's the guy that always that crazy like 30 stare or whatever, right? Yeah, you, like, it's in like Tony Hawk Pro Skater. Yeah, I remember yeah, playing yeah, that game when I was a grommy. <laughs> <laughs> Back in the day, they called it the leap, leap of, of faith. faith. Leap of he faith, just yeah. he ollied over a he did a what they call a melon grab where you grab behind your front foot, and he ollied over like, which wouldn't even have been considered something skatable. It was just like ollied over a handrail, this massive drop, which would have been about a story high, and just to just flat to the flats what like a freak. Whereas where a lot of guys when they ollie big shit, it's like they go over a distance. Yeah, but for him it was like just over the handrail and straight down and just took all 
the impact on his knees and body and squatted into it and landed it like it was crazy. And, and since then, there's another pro skater called Aaron Homoki. You might know him. He's from California and he, mm. they call him Jaws. And he's just now made a career out of like rolling off the roofs of houses and just dropping. Like, wow. I don't know how sust- sustainable it is, but... I forget what I was talking about. But yeah, like going back to injury and, and you said it earlier, like... Um, you don't weigh them you, out. You, you don't look at surf and, and skate and say, oh, I'm going to give... The skating's too much for my knees. Yeah, like I think I'm putting... Like I've put my ego aside a lot because my my motivations changed. Like growing up, it was like, I want to be the best skateboarder. And then later on, I wanted to be the, like a hot shit surfer. But I didn't really froth on surfing till my like late teens, early 20s. Yeah. Um, but it was, but now my motivation's changed. It's like, I'm in it for the long game and I want to be surfing and skateboarding when I'm 80. So when I've, since I changed that mindset and put my ego aside, I just enjoy it so much more. And ironically, I surf and skate a lot better. So when you say put ego aside, does that mean you put pushing the boundaries to progression for you is not the main objective? progression's there but it's very incremental so it's like i i measure i look for a series of small victories i'm not looking for like at the moment i'm watching you you know throw those full rotation air reverses you know and you've like that's that's big you know like that's a that's like you're really going for something big there whereas like i'm definitely not in that mindset for me like a small victory would be like you know, trying to pop a little air on the end section, okay, mm. and, and being really happy with it, you know, um, or, you know, doing a, doing like a nice turn and, and pushing the tail around and sliding and then being stoked on that, you know. Um, it's pretty important so to like enjoy that moment too when you have that little, that little ta- taste of progression too to like, you know, get psyched. I remember the other day in the water, we were surfing at Shippies, yeah? yeah, and you had one turn and you like, you spun the tail around a little bit and you were like psyched. And I was like, that's really cool. I love that. It's one thing I think i really appreciate about people that take a moment to like enjoy that they're like yeah sick like you know and people that are like beginner intermediate do that so much better than people that are that are you know pros are trying to push it all the time it's like they really get psyched on that little bit of progression incremental like you were saying yeah for sure like not fighting it anymore you know and i fought it i was fighting those things for years and just it's more surrendering surrendering to it and absorbing and enjoying every single day for what it is you know but don't get me wrong like i still think while your body still works and you're feeling good, like you need to be, like you, you're 30, you need to be doing that. Roll the you dice. need to be throwing that yeah. around because, you know, you're, it's only going to get harder and harder unless like you're Kelly Slater who's just a freak of nature and he's still doing that Sure stuff. is, yeah. So, yeah, I think there's a place for it for sure. Now, you were living in Argentina, then we, we moved to Peru. Yeah. So, where'd you go after that? Peru went up to Ecuador. So, after I studied, took the GRE, I went north. Um, and I started teaching surf lessons uh, at this random hotel, this place I stayed at right on the beach called Ayampe. That mm-hmm. was the name of the town. Um, yeah, hung around there, taught surf lessons, made like 20 bucks cash a day, and it was enough to live. So I would just do a, l- a lesson or two a day. And then we'd go into Montanita, which is like the party town, like 30 minutes from there at night, go party, have fun. And then just kind of like did that until I couldn't do anymore. And I remember at one point it just hit a wall. There's only like so much just surf and party you can do before your mind feels like it's turning to mush. And I was like, dude, it's time to like get back to some kind of challenge. Um, I remember I just had a moment when I called my dad. I'm like, dad, I'm coming home. I'm done. My objective was to learn Spanish. And at 11 months in, I was like, I'm, I got a solid foundation. I feel good. So I'm ready to come home. And I just went home. Back to California. Yeah. And that's, I applied to grad school before that. And then I started getting into schools right when I got home and then kind of just hung around home in Ventura until I got into school for a month or two. And then and Boom. then you got accepted to the University of San Diego or so California, he, San Diego. Yeah, again, kind of like ugh, a little bit like undergrad, I guess. I mean, this is a lot of my life, too. Like, uh, I applied for two different schools for two totally different masters. One was in urban planning and civil engineering, and the other one was a master's in education. The urban planning uh, master's was in North Carolina, not near the beach, at a really good school, and I got in. And then the master's was at UCSD, on the beach, at Black's, and that's <sighs> where I went. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that's epic. So I can't say that I didn't want to teach. I, I definitely was psyched on it too, but I'm sure I was guided by the ocean yet again yeah, too, like to some extent. Why teaching? Um, well, I, I grew up lifeguarding and I taught junior lifeguards and a lot of the t- 
other junior lifeguard instructors I worked with were teachers. And then in summer, they would do JG instructing jobs to make cash on the side. And they're just really good dudes. A lot of them really smart guys, really humble guys. And then their life was still around the ocean, too. And I think whether or not I was actually seeing it in that moment, I think I was kind of shaped by a lot of these guys, too, right? Yeah. And that was in Ventura. Okay. And it just felt good? Yeah, it just felt good. I don't know. It wasn't too much thinking. It was just kind of like, yep, this is right. Let's yeah. do this. And then um, actually my buddy that I was traveling in South America with that entire time, um, he applied for the same master's, got in for the same master's, and we did that together. So my travel partner from that whole entire trip, we went into grad school together at San Diego. Oh, man. So he had a big influence on in that too, Chris. Yeah, he did. Yeah. Nice. So um, your first teaching gig was at? It was in, so we call it South of the Eight while we were in grad school, and it's like in low-income area, teaching for free your first year. So you're in grad school like full-time. Like a one-year internship. And you do a one-year internship oh, as part of your, yeah. How do you survive financially part of the work experience. in that time? Um, the master's is pretty affordable, but I was also teaching a college class too, which pays for all your tuition. So tuition was paid for, um, but you have to save. So I borrowed money from my dad for this, okay. but it was a one-year program, so it wasn't too financially crazy. Mm. And you live in subsidized camp uh, housing on campus. Mm-hmm. So they make it. They try to make it easier for you. But the school I worked in was, um, yeah, just low income kids with homeless kids, uh, kids that would come from Tijuana in the morning with their family. They okay. would drive. They'd spend an hour driving every morning just to take their kids to school. Um, pretty humble people. And I think I was pretty like it's pretty pretty amazing to see that, right? And then I was sold on it. So I started doing that and finished the masters and then got a job. So then the Spanish skills must have really come in handy. Yeah, yeah, the credential was a bilingual credential as well, so I was kind of like speaking Spanish and using those skills a little bit too, which is sweet. Man, that's that's uh, really good that you taught in that kind of school. Do you think that made you a better teacher, more resilient teacher? More resilient for sure, because the kids come to school with all kinds of social-emotional stuff, which is one thing I always thought was I wanted to be helpful with, because I had those friends that were close to me when I went through tough times with school as well. Um, kind of around my parents' divorce. And I always thought the mentorship role is equally as important as the teaching role. Like at some point, mm-hmm. I think anyone's going to be able to teach themselves um, all the content. But the real learning, I think, is the social-emotional bit, which is so important, right? And that part of that is us being mentors and um, just like Beyond good, good dudes for our mm-hmm. students, right? And so that was kind of something I saw. I'm like, these kids need a place, like a safe space too. And that's totally cool. Even though they come to school and they're just, like, dead, they're exhausted because they've been up all night waving flags for, you know, drug dealers in the neighborhood. And, um, you know, they're they're actively getting courted into these gangs as well. And their life, you know, both parents are in jail and they're living with grandma, kind of stuff like this. And it's like you got to get over the hump of, like, this kid needs to learn math and science and get a good grade. And you got to get into the mindset of, dude, he's got a safe place to, to laugh and relax at school for a day. And that's partly because of you. And that's a pretty special thing, you know. And even though in the beginning of the year it's tough and he's, these kids are saying, fuck you and all these terrible things to you, you get so close to him later on in life when they realize that, or later on in the year when they realize that you got their back too. And it's all about respect. You just build a relationship based on respect with these kids. And, um, and that's, you know, uh, in some sense, a, a, the majority of what they have or all they have too is relationships that are forged in respect, I think. So it's so a it's different. It's those conversations and the interactions you're having outside the classroom. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah it's at, so important. At lunch break, and these time these kids come and see you, and they say, "Hey, Mr. B," because that's what I was there, right, Mr. B. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think about this or this and this? You yeah. know, and yeah, I really like what you said there. You know, they're coming from these really heavy home lives, and for th- for them, you're this secure, stable person and environment that they probably don't have anywhere else, and. Um, it's not. I don't think it's to be underestimated at all as a teacher, and we we often forget what has been going on in a kid's life before they came to school that morning. True. You know, and um, I, I learned I learned that lesson a few times throughout my career. You know, I'd have a I'd have a um, maybe a negative interaction with a student. You know, and then especially in my early days, and I'd you know really get up in their face and give them shit and whatever and put them on detention because they're not doing their work and then you talk to them afterwards or you have a conversation with their parent and then some of the stuff they tell you I was like well yeah he slept outside all night last night because dad was drunk again and he's been beating mum up and you know or he didn't he hasn't eaten it's heartbreaking he hasn't eaten in two days because parents haven't done the shopping because they're drug addicts it's and it's just like like even thinking about it I just almost get like goosebumps 
and um, and I think, yeah, it's just it's developing tough, that level of empathy and trying to, when you talk to a young person, try to always imagine the bigger picture behind them, and it can be really hard. And I, I think that's why teaching is one of the one of the toughest yet most significant jobs in the world. Like I'm, I'm adamant about that, you know. Yeah. So hearing you say that and the fact that you taught in that environment, I think. Oh, those skills that you've developed will just carry you carry you through for the rest of your career yeah totally yeah it's important to like remind ourselves of those moments too tough yeah it's, you've had some experiences like i remember I, I had a student as well absolutely it would break my heart dude and eventually this one kid got expelled he was like this kid johnny really really nice kid latino kid uh, mom in prison dad out but a meth addict um R- always a big smile failing all of his classes but still a big smile it's like dude this attitude is what's going to carry you buddy like keep it up keep it up and then uh, he got into drugs and it was like this is like eighth grade dude he's like 13 years old 14 years old he's like trying meth and then he brings a big bag of meth to school yeah. expelled that's how they do it in the yeah. system at home it's like we can't handle you anymore so they expel him and send him away and, and what, it, what, and what are they going to do? They expect? Yeah, what, yeah, what do they expect? What's he going to do at the next yeah. school? He's going to get into something worse because he realizes no one cares for him even the one community he had around him doesn't care for him anymore yeah. see ya and, and they're scared and so they're going to do whatever they can do to survive totally and, and they'll do what's the most accessible and who are we to blame them and judge them it's not <laughs> it's not our space to do that <laughs> for a second no yeah and like I, it, it sounds like it's similar to the australian system where you know um there's so many young people just falling through the cracks yeah. and um but it's it, it, i mean it's it's hard like it's i'm not saying that it's the system's fault and i think the systems are doing the best they can but, um, you think so? Yeah, you, and you hope so. But I think it's progressing, you know. And I think um, teaching attracts the and the people that last in teaching are the right kind of people to be teachers. The ones that aren't, they drop out. But the right ones stay, and they're the ones that I think make the big differences. And in my opinion, sure, yeah. it's easy to lose focus sometimes. Though it can get kind of convoluted with other issues and stuff between teachers and admin and all this stuff when Politics. it really it's like you lose sight of what the real picture is too mm. i find that here a little bit too um it's it's there's a lot more privilege around where we teach now too um and i find it a little bit harder to provide the mentorship role which is what i'm so i find so important you're it's so good at it i've seen you in action yeah yeah you think so definitely thanks man like i've seen the, the the interactions and the conversations you have with young people and they they really engage with you and i i, I think it's because you show them this this level of respect that they may not get elsewhere. Yeah, sure. So, nice. Yeah, I think it's everyone. I don't know. I remember one of my admin, Vicky, told me this one. She's like, they, "These every kid still needs you to some extent for something. You know what I mean? They still need you, even though some kids are more privileged than others. It's like they all still need you. So it's important to kind of remember that too. So you were teaching. You were teaching there um, at that school, and then where to from there? Did you have another teaching job or did you then move to Bali? That's where I moved from there to Bali. So I was teaching eighth grade science uh, in Oceanside. And then I applied for, um, I remember I was just kind of feeling like it's time. I was already tenured and I was getting paid a lot of money. And I was like, dude, I'm like 25 or 26 years old. Like, what am I doing? I'm like, security. Yeah, security. There's like so much security. And like, what's the next step? I'm going to get involved in a mortgage here. And it's like, it was like, hold on, I'm. I feel like I'm kind of plateauing a little bit as a teacher. I'm not getting pushed. I want like I want to embrace the discomfort a little bit. I want something different to like make me feel uncomfortable and push my learning a little bit. And I was like, you know, what, this is comfortable as this is, guys. I gotta try something different. I remember I applied to a couple jobs and then um, I didn't get them. And then the Green po- School position popped up for the exact job I was teaching, eighth grade science. And I did the whole application process, which is insane. Like YouTube video yourself. Talk us, talk us through it. Yeah. So what'd you have to do? Oh, it's insane, right? It's like. Um, y- LinkedIn account didn't have one of those uh, eight essays um, all your standard letter of reference cover letter but then a YouTube video you have to talk about yourself like what is this dude what and then you know all these interviews it's like d- eight interviews from staff to teachers to um, you know you had kitchen staff and um, parents I remember I was interviewed by all kinds of random people how many um, interviews Seven or I eight. had six or eight interviews, something around that, I- about an hour a piece. Some of them longer. I remember one with Sané was like two hours, but we just hit it off. We had a really good time talking. And um, I remember thinking at the end I was exhausted, but I felt so comfortable with them too. So I kind of thanked them for that at the end. I, I remember because I was like, you know, I'm, hey, I'm going to leave everything I know. I'm going to come to Bali. I've never even been here before. Wow. Um, 
And I remember walking into the green school and seeing all these people and hugging them instantly. And like, I instantly felt like I had a little community, even though we weren't that close yet. And it took a lot of time. Like you, we were talking about the other day, it takes time to build up that, that basis of knowing each other and level of comfort and understanding. Um, I still had this, a kickstart, you know, a head start because of all these conversations and a lot of genuine people around green school. So, yeah. Did you feel like in that interview process? Cause I mean, I went through the exact same process. It was unlike any other interview or job application I've ever been for. Did you feel like they were more concerned about getting to know you as an individual as opposed to your credentials? A hundred percent, huh? Yeah. It's funny. I remember pumping up all my stuff too. Like, oh, I've got all the experience, da, 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 da. And then the questions were none of them touched on any of that stuff. It was all based around, well, what do you feel like in this situation? You know, what's your greatest weakness? I remember at one point, Leslie even called me back. She was hungover. She's like, I'm hungover. Sorry, but I just need to know what, what is, she was sitting in her PJs at school. Oh, man, I probably, love her. Yeah, she's awesome, huh? Yeah. And she's like, sorry, excuse me, I'm a little hungover, but I need to know what is your weakness because we're not buying this. I remember I told them I'm a perfectionist, you know, I'm like, da 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 da. And that's always the kind of like a little bit. And I was struggling to kind of be aware of what the weakness was. And I think I, I understand it more now than I did then. But I was like, hey, I'm really just like, I don't, you know, I don't recognize myself for the work I do. And and she's like, I remember she told me, she's like, do you know about the tall poppy syndrome? Do you know what this is? And I was just like, that's I was Aussie. sweating. That's, a, that's an Aussie thing. I was sweating, dude. This is the, I remember they'd already, um, they were already in the final interview process too. And she hit me up just last minute and asked me this. And I was sweating bullets, dude. And we got off the phone and I wasn't feeling good for the first time. Um, and the truth was, I just wasn't real enough with her. It was too many, yeah. uh, too many. I knew she was the head honcho and I was still mm. had that, you know, that standard sort of call interview response that I would do at home or something like this. And it, it took me being here to experience this to be like, okay, now, now I know I could sit there and nail that a little better. Um, but then I couldn't really quite give it to her. So I was totally sweating it, dude, all that work. And I was like, fuck, no way. I'm not going to get this job after all this. I remember I was tripping too. Um, yeah, but it all worked out, right? So, yeah, it did. Uh, it was meant to be. Yeah, buddy. It's um, <laughs> it's it's the it's the best thing because I th- I felt like they were more assessing you for could this guy survive in Bali for starters, and uh, I think that the other thing that they really assess you for is like um, yeah, like your your resilience and how resilient you are. And um, I think that's what made the... Pro- I found the process like you very just wholesome and real. And I'd been so conditioned to just to tell people what they wanted to hear in a job application, you know? And like, and it sounds like you were doing the same thing. You too, yeah. Yeah, it's like, well, that's what you do. You you, you bullshit on your resume or you... Not bullshit, but you, you blow it up as much as you can and make yourself sound it's the as worst. good as it's possible. It's so lame. And you've got to play the game. you got to play the game. But then these guys were like... Yeah, okay, you've played the game to get to this point, but now, nah, now let's cut the bullshit. And I was like, no way, you know, like, it's really cool. And I think that process, I'm going to keep, I'm going st- to, I'm going to keep that in my head because if I'm ever in a similar position to them, I'm going to apply the same one. Yeah, 100%. Yeah, yeah 100%. Yeah. Did you take that personality test too? I took a fucking personality test. I was, that, that's, was, I was epic, sweating actually. on that the was, most. Me too. It's like a million <laughs> questions. It's like either yes or no. I remember clicking well, one. No, was like, was, was it yes and, it was yes and no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Clicking one of them was like the wrong thing. I was like, oh, fuck. Yeah. No, what did I do? No. But little did I know they were timing how long it took you to respond. Interesting. And I was just like, I am oh, a lot. No. I take forever on tests and stuff like this. I probably took my sweet ass time with everything. But were you, were you doing it going, well, Okay, there's the question. Well, what would they like to hear? You know, it took me a while. I yeah, think, and, and then, then after after about thirty or so of these questions, I'm like, I, then I started falling into that flow of like, okay, mm-hmm. here I go. I'm answering naturally what comes to mind. Boom, boom, yeah. boom, boom. Yeah, you kind of have to at that point. Yeah, for sure. I was just scared. I'm like, oh well, I've just done seven interviews, and they're gonna find out that I'm f- fucked up in the head. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, it's all it's all wasted. Whatever. Click yes, no, yes, no, yeah. whatever. Yeah, turns out I'm not that messed up. Yeah, nice, just, buddy. Glad you made it. I don't know. Like that's what came out of it that I was. And this is funny because Garrett, a mutual friend of ours, sort of had similar results that were both. People. Did he? I didn't know about this. We yeah. talked about it at a PD day, <laughs> both. And it turns out our personality tests say that we're people pleasers. Yeah. Oh, dude, mine too. I was somewhat in the middle, but more towards people pleasing. People pleasing. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, and yeah. that's partially I think for that thing too. Yeah, a bit. To some extent, for sure. I don't like disappointing people. I think I go down that route for Why? sure. I, I err on the side of keeping people happy at the at the cost, at the expense of making myself maybe not totally happy. Why do you feel like you do that? I don't know. I don't like the idea of disappointing people. Why? 
Not sure. Not sure. Sure. Yeah, it just doesn't feel good. I don't know to have someone be disappointed and. Do you feel a sense of shame? A sense of shame, yeah. Maybe a sense of guilt, like it's my fault that it's they don't you know feel happy or content if I don't do this thing. But it's not really true. So, but I think I've gotten a lot better at this too. Like saying no, I think is a huge one. I'm always a obsessed with this when I hear do these. You, do you have trouble saying no? I did for a long time. I'm better at it now. Mm. Especially here when there's so many opportunities and things happening all the time. It's insane. It's overwhelming. Mm. You have to say no, yeah. Otherwise, you overcommit. And that's something I classically do. Right? I overcommit myself to fucking everything. And then I show up to nothing. And then I feel like I'm even disappointing more people. But it's, it sounds a little extreme. I don't think it's quite like this. But um, mm. yeah, it's just you got to just say no up front. And people respect that. And you got to. That's part of the deal. Do you feel right? like that, that people pleasing is something you, you've got to work on yourself? Still, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. Yeah, especially in our job. I agree with what you're saying. Now, listen, we've got to get back to some serious shit. Yeah, let's talk tubes Tell now. Tell me about your best <laughs> barrel ever. Like, I want to, because, like, you know, you've surfed for a long time. And Dude, I know is, I know for me, yeah. like, there's there's a, there's one or, there's probably a, a handful of waves that really stand out. And there's a couple of barrels that, for me, really are just in tr- ingrained in my mind because that was like i had a full zen experience tell me about one that you had you must have had one this is gonna sound so lame i have it filmed and i have it on my phone and it was an immense it was an immense last year it's not the biggest too but it's like it's shooting straight into the the video shooting straight into the barrel and it's like a it's a short one but it's on the foam ball the whole time the reef Mm -hmm. is like totally dry and i remember just feeling completely weightless the entire time i think i held my breath entirely Mm -hmm. And kind of took off back toward the peak, and it's like you can see the tail sort of drifting. But since it's shooting straight into the the video, is shooting straight into the tube, it's hard to see. But it's easily the deepest tube I've ever had, Dude, for sure. Get it up, get it up. See, it's embarrassing, man. Fuck. I want oh, to show if, this. As if. But I, I I think it's important to kind of like look at that stuff and watch it and just you, know, you see that like. Oh man, like I'm I'm actually jealous you got it on film. Like. Don't make fun of me, dude. Um, in in hindsight, so it's I, all the same session. It's like, it started off with a couple. Kind of like a start off with a couple big, big tubes okay. like this. Right up, oh, right up. Go re- rewind it because I wanna, I wanna, I wanna, you know, watch it and talk through it. First one's I'm too far in front of it. Give me, give me the, the one. Give all me right. the one. So where's this? It's, it's, where's it, this at? This is all. Uh, this is up in the mentalize. Is it like a little secret reef wedge? Okay. It's not even a wedge. It breaks like neos almost. Okay. Um, so it looks like a four to six foot day. Yeah. So you get a bit of a chip in, like yep, roll in. in. Completely dry reef. Okay. Mean reef. So you've taken off, nice easy takeoff, draw off the bottom, the thing just doubles up, little top, little like snap under the lip to slow down, arms wide, full stand up barrel, mate in the channel, arms wide, spit in the back of the head. Okay, your mate's clapping now, it's a slow-mo, and then you kick off the back. A little bit lame for that slow-mo, but oh, yeah, it's yeah. Like, it was like it's I was absolutely sick. shaking in that And one. then there's a water photographer out there, there's two of them, do they get the water shot? Yeah. Fuck yeah, oh look at that thing. <laughs> It's just bending around the reef, hey? Yeah, and I remember I got rolled over that reef once or twice. It was absolutely bloody and shaking. I've never been rattled like that before, but I knew the waves were pumping, so I was like, dude, you got to, like... I remember taking a couple deep breaths and letting a few waves go at one point because I was like, dude, I got it. It's pumping. This is the best I've ever seen. Mark was out there actually with me as well. It looks just like the perfect amount of offshore wind. Yeah, it was beautiful. And the the really, really crazy thing was it was just us, the three of us out there, and then some good buddies from home. (laughs) Um, we're on a boat cruising around the Mens, mm-hmm. and they pulled up the only boat out there, and it was no. just our buddies from home, and it was like four of them came and paddled out. No. Just guys I haven't seen in years too. That's amazing. Pretty crazy. It's really like weird, wild one. I remember. I think we were all in tears at the end of the session. We're like, dude, this is too. This is like surreal, right? Meant to be. Yeah. But yeah, more of that, dude. Do you, do you want to hear about a memorable barrel I got? Now, dude. Now. Thanks for asking. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, for me, like actually, the best, the most memorable barrel. I've ever had was in the Maldives and I didn't even come out of it but I know to about this, this day like it was a jaw dropper it was this there's this spot there called Cokes and the Maldives actually had like some solid swell and like I love it there because it gets a lot of intermediate surfers or, or even beginners and it's a pretty mellow vibe in the water and um but then once it gets over sort of four sort of up to four to six feet it clears the line up so we caught this boat to this spot called Cokes and it really barrels and um, I'd been surfing it sort of all week and I was getting super comfy out there and I was on a 5-4 pod of all boards but because I'd been surfing it all week in smaller conditions, 
I was just like, I'm not going to change boards now. I'm just going to stick with this board, you know. And I just started getting some cool little barrels on it. And I'd kind of cracked the code because I've never been a great barrel rider. And where I live, don't get a lot of good barreling waves, you know. So it's a lot of beach breaks and stuff like that, like small little beach breaks. But anyway, it was right on dusk and the boat was ready to leave. It it, it sort of unanchored and everyone had paddled back to the boat. And there's just me and another guy out there. And the set started really pulsing. And the sunsets in the Maldives are fucking unbelievable. Like, I mean, the sunsets in Bali are epic, but it's the same thing except, I don't know, it just gets just this massive sun just falling behind the horizon sort of thing. And um, the boat's like, everyone's on the boat calling us and the surf guide was like, come on, guys, fucking I want to go, blah, 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 you know. And these sets come and there was like this just magic one was coming through and it wasn't my turn and it was this other dude's turn and I was like, oh, fuck, you know, like have to let this guy go and he paddles for it paddles for it and he just misses it and i'm like oh my god and then the one behind it was even better and he started paddling for it i was nope. like ah uh-uh. dude you yeah, fucking no way. had your no chance way. You, gotta, dude. you gotta speak up in that you moment too you had it, it. you I told him i just was like well i was so frothing and exhausted i was like i just was like as i'm paddling i'm just like go, shaking my head going nah 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 like looking at him like nah 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 and then this thing came through paddled in dropped in and as I pulled into the barrel and like I was right in there and I'm like, oh my God, I'm right in there and I'm racing it. And then because the sun was setting and it was so glassy, just this kaleidoscope of colors in the barrel. And that's what made wow. it so special. And I was so in it. And then all of a sudden, like I'll never forget it. Everything just went quiet and I was so in it. I'm like, I'm not coming out. I'm so fucking deep. And everything went quiet and all I just remember is feeling the wind in my ears because I was going so fast and just the sound of the barrel and I just stuck with it until eventually my board got sucked from under my feet, got rolled, bounced off the reef but didn't get hurt and just popped up just like, (sighs) and just like, I think I started like getting emotional. I'm paddling back to the boat and then like everyone on the boat's like, yeah. I was like, like that was the best wave of my life. And I'll never forget too, like when that, that had that, Everything just went slow. Have you had that moment? Everything just went slow. All I could hear was the wind. And I just felt my face and my jaw just go, like my jaw just dropped as I'm in the barrel. I just went, like, it was a Zen moment for sure. I've never really quite had that ever since. So, so cool, huh? When you like really push it and go super deep on these kind of waves, you bounce off the reef but you don't get hurt. Or like you find when you hesitate, you get injured. But when you just send it, you just go yeah, for it. That's when you're not getting hurt. No hesitation, right? Yeah. And the reef in, Sounds I don't epic. know if you surfed in the but the reef there is like so different to Indo. It's like really flat reef. Like it doesn't have big coral heads oh, okay. in most spots. So, oh, that's sick. Yeah, man. That's sick. So what's Go what's next? Summer. What's next for you after Bali? Like, what, what are you? You're in Bali now. You're working in an awesome school. Yeah. You live in an awesome area. So what's next, man? I don't know. I think it'd be cool to take this experience. I, I'm not a, like a future planner guy. I'm kind of more like year to year tops. I don't know. Maybe I should write down like a five year plan or something. Just sounds Why? boring. Who Why? cares? Yeah. Um, I don't know. It'd be cool to like take experience from this sort of stuff, like the mentorship roles and the stuff that are really, things are really important to us. And then the ocean, which is super important and what we're passionate about and like Mm. build something with it. Yeah. Like some kind of program, whether it's here or back home or some kind of like ocean school. Okay. Like the blue school. Could be. Yeah. But not in the Seychelles and not $10,000 and not run by idiots. (laughs) Less corporate. Less corporate. Yeah. Do you, um, you're part of a really good program called the Surf Ocean Ambassador Program, which was started by some some guys at the school and students. It's been going for some time, but you're you're involved in it. Like, can you tell us about like what the program's about and and why you're interested in it? Yeah, so but so it was created by Pac Francis, I think, from our school, right? He's one of the main guys, and I think it's like an ocean ambassador program, just getting well-rounded kids different experiences at, um, in and around the ocean. You know, I think they have stand-up paddle where they go pick up trash. Out, outside the reefs and then they go stand up paddling there's always a component where it's like you're you're active and around the water but you're also aware of what's happening in the environment it's getting trashed around here too in bali so um then for us with jalan jalan surf the idea is we give bamboo straws and we trade them for plastic straws at the warungs on the beach and then ideally we do that first and we go for a surf mm. together and then afterwards you know we decompress and we chat about the surf maybe we shoot photos of each other surfing and we look at them later or something like this um and then there's that big surf comp at the end of the year and ocean festival and yeah just celebrating the ocean and trying to do a little bit of good while we're out there too 
Yeah. And like what skills do you, what skills and you know, personal qualities do you think you're developing in those young people? Hmm. That's a good question. I think a bit of responsibility for sure, right? Not only just that, hey, we need you there on time. Hey, we should be picking up trash first before we get the, the carrot. Um, <laughs> but like, uh, yeah, just a, a sense of ocean awareness and the power of the ocean here. And I think that's a big a big instructor here, getting the kids out in the surf and just involved with this and mm. um, safe but pushing the limits a little bit too, right? Yeah, because it is a very powerful beast the indian ocean isn't it it's tricky it's funny here because we can really push the limits we can go surf over some gnarly reef with the kids if we want to we're something at home that would never <laughs> just simply never happen too regulated it's a little bit terrifying right i get a bit anxious with that as well but i think it's important to let them have that experience and be there for them too yeah and i think that's what i love about surfing it it forces you out of your comfort zone and mm. i feel like then you can apply that to other aspects of your life sure yeah which is it's a good little thing for the kids to experience. That's an interesting analogy. You kind of like, like getting pushed out of your comfort zone mm. is something you want to just do in and out of the water. Yeah. I like, I, again, as I get older, I, I, I kind of like same with skateboarding for me. It's because a lot of the time on a skateboard, you spend most of your time falling off and then you get back on and you, then you fall off and you get back on and you fall off and you get back on. Yeah, true. And again, it's, as I reflect on my life, it's been a really good teacher in terms of, when life bucks you off or you fall, you just you just get back up. True, huh? Yeah. Well, there's always like, a, with surf, I think I always see it as like a, a reprieve. You get a second chance at the day. You get a frustrating day, a, a bummed out day. You're, you know, you're sad, you're upset. You can go reset. So it's always like a giant reset button. You hop in the water, you get your system shocked. You get smashed by a wave, ideally, right? And then you kind of re- have that reset button, that reprieve. Yeah. that's. I reckon that's a good way to end, bro. Nice, buddy. Man, it's been epic. It's been an hour and 25 minutes. Damn, that's crazy. It's been great just talking surfing. Um, and, uh, you know, fun, is there anything dude. else you want to add, brother? Want to oh, add man, anything else? I was happy to talk to you. It was really fun. Yeah, it's yeah, cool. Man. It's like crazy how stuff just kind of comes out and we're chatting and it's good to just talk surf, too. For sure, bro. Yeah. Yeah, and, um, yeah, dude, well, let's hit it. And you wanna, are you going to go for another surf? Let's go for a surf. Let's do it. Let's go. Right. Let's call it. Let's see ya. Ooh.